And you're live. Okay. Hey, I think that looks pretty good. Our behind the scenes Patreon should be turning it around and showing everybody our dirty kitchen. <laughs> no, we're the front forward. <laughs> There's no kitchen on the other side of this. Right. Sorry. 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 Okay. We're in? I think we're in. Folks, let us know for sure you can hear us. Turn the screen down just a little bit. We can do that. Yeah. Yeah. There. That's a little more. Yeah. Hi, Heritage Village. Welcome back, Heritage Village. Who all we got? Okay. So, are we ready? I think we're going. Well, thank you so much, everybody, for coming to uh, today's live stream. This has been a great way uh, for us to keep up with everybody as our content video-wise has got a little thin since we're still trying to get that absence documentary done. Uh, that's going to be going on for a little while longer. Uh, but uh, today, um, what I've been doing for the past several days is getting ready for an in-person Victorian barroom event that's a little bit different from what we usually do, uh, but we thought it would be kind of a good opportunity to talk about in-person events um, and whatever you guys want to talk about, because that's what we're here for. Yeah. Um, so what what is coming up is um, my buddy uh, Dave Phipps is throwing a private uh, Old West event down at his place in Elizabethtown, Kentucky. He literally built a small fort on his property uh, quite a while back. I met Dave through Revolutionary War reenacting, uh, and then it turned out that we both kind of had this uh, shared passion of uh, about the Old West uh, here in, uh, in America. So uh, he has uh, decided to get just uh, invite a few close friends out to try doing this thing out of his place. And so naturally he asked me to be uh, the saloon keeper. And so I'm able to do some things at this event that I can't necessarily do at public events because this is literally just this is a private party this is just a uh, it's, it's there's no tickets there's no sales anything like that it's a bunch of guys getting together uh that dave assembled for this for this little party so that's what i've been doing um all weekend yeah and so this is a private event on private property exactly yeah so so that's different than i think most of what we usually get to do yeah and so we'll get into that and how that's different and how these things usually go and how you might, do you have any ideas of how to, how to get us out places? <laughs> uh, so the menu, the, the event is, uh, it's set in 1880 in Colorado because Kentucky looks more like Colorado than like Texas. And uh, this is really special for me because my two favorite decades ever are the 1840s and the 1880s. And so generally when I get to do those at an event or a site or something, it's usually kind of getting crammed in around the edges, like either the very early or the very late end of something. And that's not what most people are doing. So the fact that Dave has thrown this uh, this party, this event uh, that is set in 1880, I've just been going all out. This is the only event this year I think I've really put effort into just because I've been so excited about this. I got the uh, this cowboy hat here. Uh, this started out as a dusty beat up hat I found in um, Russell, Kansas. Completely took it apart, redid the innards to be historically accurate, redid the crease and all that. It's ready to go. I've got my trusty Colt 1873 Peacemaker. Not a real 1873. I don't have $20,000 to spend on one, but it's pretty good. Uh, and the menu for uh, the weekend uh, is going to be uh, Brandy Sangaree, uh, a gin or brandy fix, uh, the 1874 Mint Julep, the frozen absinthe, and what am I forgetting? whiskey the whiskey cocktail so that's our menu for the weekend so that's our menu for today what would you like uh i would love we don't have pineapple for the mint julep we do don't we? have any pineapple right now that's one of the if you saw the video that was one of the neat things about that canned pineapple would just come in so they're using that in the juleps okay um in that case can i have a frozen absinthe please frozen barkey yeah that was uh something we featured at south park city museum uh, an interesting way to prepare absinthe other than the fountain, which is very luxurious. Um, yeah, so by the way, the thing about the peacemaker, you all don't know, like, my husband here loves his peacemaker, his reproduction. So there's, there's this joke behind the scenes, like with us every time we're getting ready for an event, he's always like, hey, how many peacemaker rounds do I need for this? I, you know, usually we're going to like a Revolutionary War event or something where I'm like, I'm sorry, honey, you don't, you don't need any peacemaker rounds. 
Um, <laughs> this is the first time where the actual thing I needed for it was the Peacemaker, so I'm very excited. <laughs> okay, so the Frozen Amazon, this is a fun one uh, because it's very easy. You don't need a lot of special equipment. Uh, it comes from 1882. This is the only recipe that I actually breached the 1880 date of the event with because I just wanted to include a neat absinthe recipe. Um, so we're going to try our Verde Absinthe from St. George Distillery out in California, one of our favorites. It is a great um, crossroads between price point and quality. Yeah. Uh, we're going to do an ounce of that. Behind the bar, 1882 was uh, the manual that this recipe came from. And I did tweak it a little bit because they had it a little bit weak as far as the flavor. But, you know, as that goes. So that's our absinthe. We're going to need two ounces of water. Just plain water. Because, uh, remember, absinthe is a very high-proof alcohol, but it's meant to be cut. It's not meant to be drank straight. Two ounces of water. And a teaspoon of our gum syrup. Gum syrup we've met a lot on the show. With it, I can smell it. All okay. right. um, you don't have to make it. You can. I highly uh, endorse Liber and Company's products. They're doing some great old, old mixology ingredients out there. So we got some questions coming in in the chat already. I'll just wait till you're great. done with this lovely beverage. Excellent. So we're just going to put some ice in the shaker. And this is Amy's favorite tumbler that we've got. It's from the 1890s. It's got a beautiful red ruby stain. That is my favorite color, is that, that burgundy ruby color of red. And it's just so decadent like that. But we're saying we're getting gilded. <laughs> gilded age. There you are, dear. Thank you, darling. You're welcome. Oh, wow. And just the smell of that. That is so lovely. Oh, that's really good. Right? That's really, really delightful. So that was what? Just two, one water and absinthe. Mm -hmm. And then. The gum, how much gum syrup? Teaspoon. Teaspoon of gum syrup. Shake it up. Shake it up and yep. go. Completely, uh, completely accurate to the Victorian period. You don't need a lot of special equipment, uh, and very good. That's become our go-to. Yeah. 1882. If people had simple syrup, could they use that? Sure. Yeah, don't let that stop you. Okay. Yeah. So let's get some questions before we go on to the next. Yeah, one. absolutely. <laughs> um. Oh, hey, Santa's here. Okay. Oh, Santa. So first of all, just we've got some of our great regulars are in here. Let's see. Um. Oh, somebody's made a. Comment for review. I bet it's not that bad. Um, oh, I think it was just like an emoji or something. Um, let's see. So first of all, Texas Pharaoh made it in Heritage Village. It's Lauren. Hey, Lauren. Hey, Davina is here again. Hi. Hey, Davina. Um, and Santa Claus. Santa. Cheers, Davina. Um, let's see. There's a few questions. Davina's got one that's, I think, probably easier to start off with answering. Um, is the Peacemaker named after the Colt's Single Action Army Revolver? Yes, that is where that came from. It's the 1873 model um, that, that was called the Peacemaker. Um, and this one I've got um, is a six and a half inch barrel. So that variant, you know, you're not looking probably before 1875 with that. The 1873 version had a seven and a half inch barrel. Um, and then by 1875, you're getting a different barrel lengths. So this this is kind of unusual. Uh, a lot of times you've got like five and a half inch and four and three quarters inch. The four and three quarters are very popular with Cowboys because it's very light. Um, I like a little bit more barrel on the end. To uh, I, I find it just gives me a little bit better balance. But yeah, iconic Cowboy gun. Uh, tons and tons of these were sold uh, in the 19th century. Uh, and they're a lot of fun to shoot now. I so. have something to point out too, by the way. This is not a prop or a toy. This no. is an actual firearm. Yeah. You notice he is in no way pointing it at his no. spouse. You know, and I know that you and your friends are actually also very conscious. Of yeah. Well, there there was one time, because um, obviously I think if you've, if you've been with us for a while, you know that the point of the Victorian bar is actually talking about apples. Um, that's, that's my real goal is to be an apple orchardist. And there was one time I was alone in the apple orchard. Um, and I was using a rickety ladder to prune this tree and I fell off of it, um, with my pruning saw and, um, the ladder fell out from under me. I fell on top of the ladder. I had the saw in my hand and I cast it off 
with the blade away from me. And I credit that with good because our, I had it in my head with going around with my friends in the woods with guns and being responsible with them um, that the business end of whatever you're using stays away from you and stays away from everybody else. And so that that doing that, I credit with not cutting myself very badly in addition to cracking two ribs when I hit that ladder. <laughs> when Brian said he wanted to go to the ER, I knew it was very bad. Yeah, I thought you should do that. This man has bled for 24 hours straight and refused to go to the <laughs> ER. I was just like, oh, yes. Well, I'm going to stay very calm and drive you there <laughs> oh god but yeah you're right it's like that kind of safety training does become yeah. ingrained so mm -hmm. didn't have to think about it it just yes. the business end went away from me as quickly as possible before i hit the ground yeah that's yeah. awesome um let's see Denise suggests that peacemaker is very popular with cowboy action shooting and reenactors yep. oh yeah 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 for a reason you just can't beat it you know it, no it wasn't the only gun out there but i mean we all <laughs> saw it so much as kids you just can't help it <laughs> well and then Davina had another question of if we watched Bristow county jr no i, I didn't. didn't i'm aware yeah, of it though. i remember it being on um at the same time i was watching border town okay which was another old west show on in the early 90s i feel like yeah. if i had lived with my roommate in San Francisco long enough, I was going to be watching Briscoe County. That was like, yeah, I'm surprised. Probably on part of the education I was getting living with Jessica. Yeah. Uh, Rewatching a lot of like really good old shows. <laughs> <laughs> um, what else we got here? Let's see. Set in 1893. Let's see. Um, what we have been watching off and on lately, by the way, I'm going to say it's the best show ever. It worked out better for Richard Dean Anderson, but. Um, Legend, which was this really one season, one off and forgotten uh, show in the 90s. It had Richard Dean Anderson and um, John Delancey as a character clearly really based on Nikola Tesla uh, <laughs> as this author who had written a bunch of dime store novels about this Wild West hero and ends up hooking up with this totally not Nikola Tesla character who had all these wacky sci-fi inventions and like protecting this town in Colorado. Um, and you know, parts of it are a little silly. Again, I guess life worked out pretty well for Richard Dean Anderson with that getting canceled and him going on to Stargate. Uh, but it's, you can get the DVDs for like six bucks on Amazon. It's one season legend and it's just really fun. It's just fun. Do we have more questions before I stop being dry here? Um, okay, we have an ongoing love of Briscoe County in the chat. <laughs> Uh, Davina, you'll like Legend. You will. Um, okay. And then Texas Pharaoh had a really more complicated, important question that might get to some of what you wanted to talk about, which is how you're dealing with living oh, yeah. history and the, the saloons that get set up there sometimes with the taverns and the local laws. That's actually central to the topic we're about to discuss. Yeah. Uh, so, uh, yes, I'm going to go ahead and mix myself up something, then we're going to move on into that. Thank you for uh, asking that and for being here for that information, because that's one thing we wanted to talk about. Um, could you get my bar spoon for over there while I start this? Yeah. I'm going to have the whiskey cocktail. And that's going to figure into something else that we're going to talk about a little bit later. So this is a Victor this is a true cocktail, and we've we've thank you. We've heard on the show before that this is a subcategory of Victorian mixed drinks, not just a a slang for a mixed drink in general like we might do it. So I'm going to do um, two ounces of uh, bourbon whiskey. You can use whatever kind of whiskey you like. I love the old Bardstown for uh, mixing this kind of stuff. It's got a great character to it. It's from the Willet Distilling Company. So if you have if you know bourbon at all, you know Willet's pretty pricey. This is kind of the budget version, but it's one of the tastiest budget versions of anything I've ever tasted in my life. My scoot our camera a little closer. Okay. I'm gonna try. Now, here's one interesting thing I've come up with because we've got our gum syrup, it's very thick. Um, and the manual calls for three to four dashes of it. The problem is you can get these great little dashers um, that look great for a period setting. They're copper on top of a cork, uh, but even my wider ones are too narrow for the gum syrup to pass through. And so I'm going to estimate that that means about a half a teaspoon. Dashes are very subjective. Okay. Few dashes of our Boker's bitters. We've seen these guys a lot. Very popular in the Victorian period. Um, reformulated today. You can get them from a few places online. They can ship them straight to your door. Uh, my advice is the prices are consistent a lot on these on these shops that have this. Be sure you're not getting screwed on shipping. You don't have to be. Um, it's like if all of a sudden your 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 total is shot to forty dollars, just keep on hunting around sites until you get more reasonable shipping. I've been over that. Do a few dashes of that.
I need to pace myself on this app so this really is delicious. Ice. So pretty. Let's see what I got. Stir it until it's chilled. And so this is a true cocktail. It has the spirit um, of sweetener, the bitters, and it's about to have some citrus in it. Uh, we have a whole episode out there on the cocktail, which was a lot of fun. Um, and this was early on. These go back to the late 18th, early 19th century, even though that wasn't the popular way to drink at that point. And the scandalous thing about them for those guys was that bitters were meant as a medicine. And using medicine for a recreational purpose is always seen as dangerous. And so the cocktail was seen as very dangerous in its early days. We're going to strain that into this glass here. All right. And this is a beautiful glass you've got here, too. I like this. I like the ones with the bird patterns. We're using all real Victorian glassware here. I won't touch it yet and show off the glass. But. Okay, I'm just going to express this peel over the top of it. A lot of people leave it on as a garnish, and that's usually how it's done. I kind of like to get the citrus flavor just floating over the top of the glass and get rid of it. Um, because I like, I like the sensory experience happening without the drinker actually seeing where it is it's coming from. So they just kind of experience everything with their senses uh, without necessarily looking at all of the elements right in front of them. And it's good. Oh, that's really good. Mm. Yeah, and I'll just try to hold that glass out as well. Yeah. So I don't think you actually give yourself enough credit, hon, for like oh. how cool it is that you've assembled this amazing period glassware. Well, it was something that, you know, as for me with the past, it's like I'm not I'm not like a lot of antique collectors, I guess. I like figuring out what I like that I can access that maybe other people don't place value on that I think is really neat. And so there, there's a lot of glassware out there that's like that once you know what you're looking at. Yeah. So a couple of announcements as we move into this uh, discussion about um, in-person events. Uh, Monday, August the 14th at 8 p.m., live right here on YouTube. Uh, we're going to be on My Whiskey Den. Uh, if you haven't checked those guys out, definitely do. They have a show almost every Monday night. Uh, it's a lot of fun to watch, and it's especially a lot of fun to be on. So that's My Whiskey Den. Uh, we'll be on uh, Monday, August the 14th at 8 p.m. They've got a pretty fun active chat, too, I always feel they like. They do, yeah. I mean, it's not just they'll respond to you sometimes while they're going, but also, like, people in there. It, it, it's a really fun time to just tune in to a My Whiskey Den episode. Yeah, great discussions. Uh, then Saturday, October the 7th, we're going to be at Vinoge for an event out there. Alan Bishop is going to be involved with that one, talking about absinthe. And I believe he's got a special presentation about absinthe, right? Yeah, I'm really excited about this one. Yeah, and reservations, right? Um, I would go look on the Musée de Vinoge website. Yeah. And yeah, because that could sell out. So yeah. that's to be clear, that's not on YouTube. That's 100% will be that's there. in person. And that's open to the public to buy tickets, learn more about absinthe. Um, we'll be working the bar. Yeah. So we'll, I'm not actually sure if we'll be in the, the bar they have set up in the cottage right now. Think or in the, the cottage. Oh, cool. I believe we're in the cottage, yeah. Um, yeah, so you can actually come. We'll serve you. Yeah. But so seriously, yeah, if um, it takes reservations, get a reservation for that talk by Alan. Uh, on absinthe, there's not. I don't think there's anybody who knows more about absinthe since the Gilded Age ended. Uh, it's going to be fantastic. Well, and he's especially researched in that particular part of Indiana. Yeah, that's the documentary they're working on right now is Switzerland County absinthe. Right. So you're hear some great stuff at that. Uh, we'll be back at Vinoge on Saturday, December the 9th for their Christmas event. That's where we do the Christmas punches. Um, and then we're working on a mid-December evening with Heritage Village in Sharonville. Lauren's right here. Um, I won't give details on that because I, I know we haven't actually pinned that down, but I think we've got a date. Uh, we just got to get the details squared away, and we will be back at Heritage Village, which is very special to me because that is one of the places where history really came to life for me first as a kid. So it's always Always amazing to be back there and doing it with these guys. They got a great crew. Yeah, Lauren, if, if that date we discussed is good with you all, go ahead and drop it in the chat. If you, you know, just if not, just go ahead and say you're still working on pinning it down. That's fine. But we'll, because they have a lot going on out there, obviously, especially during the holidays. So I know there's a lot to coordinate. But um, if it's good with you, let everybody know, please. So. I'll go ahead and start talking about in-person events a little bit, especially since we already had a question about it. 
We have one other question too of why we were focusing on the 1880s. I think for folks who came in later, maybe. You oh right, yeah. If you came in a little bit later, why are we focusing on the 1880s? Uh, because this weekend, um, there's a buddy of mine uh, here in Kentucky. Uh, I got to know him through Revolutionary War reenacting, but we discovered a mutual love of the Old West as well. Uh, and he built a little fort on his property a, a long time ago, actually. And uh, he's throwing a private little um, event set in 1880 in Colorado. Since kind of being in Kentucky, you're looking at like you're Colorado or Montana if you're going to set out the Old West. Um, so we're going to be in 1880 Colorado, uh, which is really special for me because the 1880s were one of my favorite decades. And usually if I'm doing that at an event, it's crammed in around the edges. This time it's actually the point. And so uh, Dave just got um, invited a few friends that he trusted um, with, you know, alcohol and firearms in the same area location we won't be doing both at the same time obviously um and dave's the whole military guy so he uh he he has the process and the order down so uh but yeah we'll be out there doing that and naturally i'll be the saloon keeper for for the weekend um so uh, and that kind of leads into what we're doing so one of the things i've been doing to get ready i've been going all out on this thing um so i've been getting our alcohol ready it's it's 1880, and so if you've watched our video on bottled whiskey, that wasn't really something that was happening with American whiskey yet or American brandies um, and things of that nature. It was mostly being sold from the barrel at that point, if it had been barrel aged. Old Forester had started bottling whiskey by then. They started in the 1870s. But uh, since that wasn't the norm, what I've done is I've saved a bunch of bottles that look kind of period-like, and I've been as if um, I've drawn them off of a barrel, and I've just handwritten my... Uh, my label of what it is. This is actually the uh, Alan Bishop's Old Clifty Hoosier Apple Brandy from, uh, from Spirits of French Lick, uh, one of my very favorite spirits ever and really was kind of responsible for launching all this. Um, so that's going to be featured. Um, if this was an in-person event, uh, or no, I'm sorry, if this, this, this it is in person, if this was an open to the public event, uh, like we do at Heritage Village uh, or something like that, I would not be able to do this uh, I, legally. Uh, because when you're serving alcohol legally um, at, a, at a public event that you've sold tickets for, it has to be in the bottle that it started in. Um, so I would not have been able to decant those uh, into a nondescript bottle like this and just put my own label on it. That would be illegal. So that's one of the things, one of the many things that we deal with. Um, and the law never thinks about history. <laughs> it's part of the thing. We, we run into that a lot. Um, and so when I do an in-person public event, which are a lot of fun, We've tried them a number of different ways. What I bring is the presentation, and that's it. Um, I don't buy alcohol. I don't sell alcohol. Um, any regulatory compliance, that's all on the host organization. Okay, so I'm doing it. It's kind of a private thing, but it's also a restaurant coming up at, at the beginning of September. That's really easy because they have a bar all the time. And so they've already got their license in place and all that. When I go someplace else, the license, the insurance, the liability, the purchasing, the selling, that's all on the venue because I can't do that as an individual. Um, and in Kentucky, uh, I got very familiar with this stuff uh, when I worked for Locust Grove. I got jerked around by the ABC one too many times and I went down and sat in a lady's office until I was repeating back to her exactly what. Uh, what so to we remind were. people what position you were in. I, I, was the, I was the program director at that point. Um, and what kind of, and what, like, what ways were you having to deal with this for what kind of events? Well, because I was, I was having to do the licensing for events like this for what, for what I'm doing at these other sites. And so I was responsible for obtaining the licenses. Um, for living history for events. For events and yeah. things like that. Um, and so I can tell right off the bat if I, if when I walk into a place for one of these events, if they have not dotted all their I's and crossed their T's. Um, my boss, Carol, at that point told me I might want to consider being an alcohol paralegal. <laughs> no, because I mean, you seriously yeah. went down there and met with these people. And I know you were like, yeah, and you wouldn't let there be any vagueness. No, yeah, because yeah, they, they denied a license one time for something they hadn't stated on their application and that I wasn't going to have it again. Um, so um, when you're doing that kind of thing, in order to really relate to what's going on with the law, um, if you're trying to set one of these events up, you're trying to navigate the ABC, alcohol beverage control uh, kind of thing, is you've got to set aside any idea that this is about being reasonable or about anybody's safety, okay? Not that there's not an element to that and not that they don't ride the coattails of that, but alcohol law is about keeping money flowing in the direction of the government and the big producers, period. That's what it's all based in. It's been that way since the Civil War and people get vindictive when you've got that kind of uh, motivation. 
Okay, that's that's what shapes this whole thing. When when distillers are you know when, when you're when you're running the distillery, the bulk of your paperwork is for the Tax and Trade Bureau. Okay, not for the ABC at all. Um, so it, it's not going to make sense intuitively. It's not going to be like, well, I'm just keeping people safe because that's not how the law is formed. And I'm not saying I agree with it. I don't. Tell us how you really feel. Honey. <laughs> no, and I know this this sounds like I'm preaching, but that, that's that's how you got. That's how yeah. if you're going to plan one of the, these events, that's how you got to approach it. Uh, is from that standpoint, not not just thinking about from from the standpoint of safety um, and being reasonable, but you've got to know that these laws were shaped with the motivation of keeping money flowing in certain directions. Um, and so you just kind of got to dig into it and uh, and be thorough, so that if anybody walks in, um, you've got all your eyes dotted and t's crossed. And at Locust Grove, uh, when we got our license, our year 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 round license there. Um, when the state inspector showed up and he was a cool guy, uh, honestly, I really liked him. I had a cell phone number. I could call him up. He'd help me through any issue I had. Um, I had a folder packed full of so much information that I knew, um, there was not going to be an issue. I think I threw more information at him than he wanted. Um, and and so, so if I'm remembering this correctly, also just to take a step back, you, at first you were dealing with this for two or three times a year, special events like the market fair. Right. And then as I recall, while you were there, you all ended up getting like a, a general standing right. permit. In Kentucky, it's called a qualified uh, state historic site license. And so it's, it's for historic sites specifically. And we got, and it allows you to sell alcohol all year round at any event you want to. Uh, they will pop in on you at any time. But like I say, the important thing is to familiarize yourself with the law. Uh, it might not be convenient for your purposes, um, but especially with some creativity, um, you can make it work. Um, and, you know, for me, it was so if somebody out there is wanting to start just like an historic event. They'd be mm -hmm. going for the temporary permit. Yes, whatever state you're in, um, that would be a temporary license. I don't know what the law is in all the states. Like I say, it's really great here in Kentucky if um, if you're going to go for it all year round. If this is going to be an integral part of your programming, which we were starting the distillery. Uh, the small farm distillery at Locust Grove yeah. at that point. And so it was going to be an integral part of our programming. So it was worth it for us to get that more expensive license that covered us for all year uh, and the insurance policy that went with it. Um, and it was really great. It yeah. was it opened whole new doors for us. Um, well, I know that's when you and I and some of the all the vol you like designated certain volunteers who would be serving too. Mm -hmm. And we all went through the actual bartending training. Yeah. It's called star training in Kentucky. It's, it's safe server training, is yeah. what it is. And in Kentucky, you have to have that. Like I said, the law is different. You do have it bit. online in Kentucky. Yeah. It's, nice. it's cheap, it's easy. Um, and since we were doing it for the site, they covered it. Um, but you just want to familiarize yourself uh, with, with how that works in your state or your locality. It is doable. Um, you just got to sometimes pry the information out of the people. What I found is the people on the office side get off on denying your application. The inspectors in the field were actually very helpful. I actually really got along well with those guys, and I could call them up, and they they get me covered anytime I needed to. You know, it's really yeah. I've lived in Kentucky. I have found, like, with different bureaucracies, 70% of the time with people in this state, people are pleasant. Yeah. You know, surprisingly, the folks, the one time I got laid off, oh, my God, the people at the unemployment <laughs> office in Kentucky were just, like, pleasant. Now, that was pre-pandemic. I don't know what happens to them in the meantime, but surprisingly pleasant and helpful. But there's just, yeah, you've got to cover yourself for that person who's not. Um, in the chat, it's looking like there are a few people who have dealt with this. Oh, um, great. Davina Duckworth says a lot of events avoid selling alcohol mm -hmm. just because it's such a hassle. Uh, and, and that's true. And the thing is, when I took over as program director at Locust Grove, that's about where they were at. And I was like, no, wait a minute. It's like, we have, there is a process for this. You we're going to crack it. Yeah. And, and I've been over backwards to crack that. Yeah. I was very proud of it. And it's like, they, it was when, when, the, uh, when they denied that application for one of our historical balls. And uh, it wasn't because of anything that was on the application. I called the lady up. I'm like, this wasn't on the paperwork. She's like, no, but you just got to have, to, you just got to know it. I was like, well, okay. I said, I'm going to come down there. I'm going to sit in your office. I said, you let me know when it's a good time to come down there and sit in your office. You're going to tell me exactly what we need to do. And I'm going to repeat it back to you. And we're going to do that until we're good. She's like, no, I think the phone call, I think the phone's good. I was like, no, the phone hasn't going to work. You let, you tell me when is a good time to come sit in your office. And we're going to spend as much time on this as we can. And I did. And I didn't get any more problems. You never had <laughs> yeah. that. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Um, once it became clear, you would drive to Frankfurt. Yeah, I wasn't going to have that. It's like, there is a process. We're going to crack this. And we did. <laughs> uh, Texas Pharaoh says it's laws, not logic. Yes. Uh, Large Mac and various people are agreeing with you. Um, 
Lauren at Heritage Village says, can confirm it's a pain in the rear, one of my least favorite parts of my job, licensing lift. So that's Ohio. I will say, um, I'm not as familiar with Ohio law as Kentucky, but you guys at Heritage Village do one of those thorough jobs that I've seen. Like I say, I know when somebody hasn't hasn't done their homework and you guys did and I appreciated that. Yeah. 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 It, 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 yeah. <laughs> and it's one of the reasons I think we've been hesitant to even do more in person mm -hmm. events. Yeah. Cause, cause sometimes it, it, it's freaked me out a couple of times, but it hasn't been done. So yeah, we're, we're trying to fall back and look and, and really get our ducks in a row as far as our paperwork and, and legal agreements about what it is we are and are not providing and responsible for. The prosecutor's son comes out. Yeah. My dad's a federal prosecutor. <laughs> I like making booze and he prosecutes crimes. <laughs> uh, I'm sorry, I will never think that's not funny. Yeah. Um, wow, I think we, people are liking the info. Great. Um, and I would just, you know, reiterate from watching him go through this process. Um, we don't want to give anybody any specific legal advice because Brian bent over backwards to learn this in Kentucky. No idea about the others, other states, um, and I gosh knows that alcohol laws change so much state to state yeah. but if there's a key message it is like look you will figure it out but you got to do devote the time and just be thorough but it is worth it yeah yeah and if you're wanting to do an event in kentucky i can help you with that you know and, and i'll do whatever i can to get us to where we need to be on that because i was i, I was really proud of cracking a lot of that um so yeah the that, inspector that's was impressed with your documentation <laughs> that's right the end. Yeah. you might have been annoyed <laughs> <laughs> But it, it is doable. Um, and so the way it usually goes, um, we, we've done it a number of different ways. Um, it's all a little different, but similar. And so you're technically selling by the drink. Um, and so we, we, we piece out which drinks we're going to do, even though everybody's getting the same thing that's figured into the price. Usually everybody's kind of buying the same thing. Um, and then we kind of sell it that way. Uh, what I do, once we get those ducks in a row, uh, we agree on a menu usually. Um, and then I send the site a shopping list. And we should, I think, stop and clarify mm -hmm. here that so far we've been focusing pretty much on living history events because I think that is where a lot of people come in with their interest. We've also done some Victorian barroom events at other venues, though, either that aren't like part of a big market fair mm -hmm. that are like maybe the evening of drinks that we did at Heritage Village that we'll be doing again on December 15th. I see very good. December the, the 15th, Heritage Village in Sharonville. It's one of my favorite places in the world. The, the crew is great there. It's going to be a good time. We're going to do a Christmas theme. Uh, it's going to be nice and crisp and cold. And we'll probably be wandering through the village and doing multiple hot drinks. So I'm so excited. <laughs> yeah. Um, but also like we've done stuff with other event venues in town. So yeah. we're moving out of there's, there's events we do. I think there's, there's so many things under this umbrella. There's having a tavern set up at a living history event, which is part of what you were talking about is just making sure Steve could sell alcohol at market fair. Right. And then there's like the Victoria bar room rolls into heritage village and does a drink night there. And then there's some times where we've just done like an evening or been just part of the thing at, um, there's always a great place here in LaGrange that unfortunately just closed called the gallery at Gatewood yeah, where she had a great just Christmas party one time and we were there bartending. Again, that was a venue that had its own regular alcohol right. license. So we just to, to clarify what we're talking about, um, we have done and hope to continue to do these things in various different sets of circumstances in different states. And it's a lot of the complexity. And one thing I do want to point out here too, and this might be, what's that? Davina says some people think mixed drinks were invented in the 20th century. That's what I think really made us want to do this show is because, you know, we started in the classic era too. It's like, well, that's the start of mixology. And suddenly we started just laying our hands on these other sources because we were in the Victoria period. So wait a minute, this is a whole different character. It's a whole different thing. Let's talk about it. Um, one tip to um, anybody who's, this is, the same in almost every state, I think. And this came about after Prohibition. Um, prohibition was repealed, but some people don't quite get it. Um, there's usually kind of a three-part system to getting a drink to you, okay? So there's the producer, there's the distributor, and there's the retailer. So when you're having an event, you are the retailer. You're selling by the drink. The distributor is between you and the producer, okay? The distributor is not a liquor store. OK, um, the the that's in between that, that's the liquor, the, the, the liquor store gets it from the distributor. OK, and then you and they're the retailer. In this case, you're the retailer. So you get it from the distributor. What happens most of the time is, first of all, you're getting it for a wholesale price. Or you're getting it cheaper. Secondly, they bring it to you. All right. You actually usually can't go and pick it up. Even if you're only ordering one bottle, they bring it to you. 
once you have your license number, you contact the appropriate distributor. Uh, and even if you don't know who that is, all the distributors know who each other are and they know who carries what. And so when I was at Locust Grove doing purchasing for the events, um, if I didn't know what to do, I would just talk to somebody else I had on the line and they, usually they tell me what to do um, and they would bring the bottle to me. It's cheaper and it's the legal way to do it. Okay, so. Uh, and it saves you time. It, it saves for you all time, of Locust Michigan, yeah. this is the one thing that's like, if you are planning an event and you're already trying to keep the budget low, you're running around crazy, this is when we're following the rules actually saves you time yeah. and money. It sounds like a hassle and it is the first time. But once you get it, once, you, once you've once you got it nailed, uh, it's going to be great from then on out. You're going to be getting your stuff for cheaper. It's going to come right to your door. It's going to be what you want. Uh, it's going to be great. So don't take my shopping list and go to the liquor store. Take my shopping list and contact your local distributors because at this point, you are the retailer in this process. The, the liquor store is also the retailer. They're getting it from the distributor. You're getting it from the distributor. And so that's how that works in most states after prohibition. Yeah. Um, Texas Fair had a comment. Sounds like I need to make friends with a current TABC agent and get the inside skinny. I'm guessing you're planning an event. Um, I'm going to assume that you mean that comment in terms of what Brian just described. Um, but please bear with me while I address it from both possible sides. Because what you do need to do is do what he said is like call these people. That whole thing of you got denied for something that wasn't on the form but is known. Yeah. yeah. I don't what? think you meant this Texas Pharaoh, but I will address it from the side. Do not, do not, do not, however, assume so-and-so is my buddy. No, and the office people typically aren't. They're not your buddy. So yeah, make them walk through, make them walk through every minute detail with you. If they didn't want, if, if they if, if they think that's a pain in the ass, they shouldn't have been a pain in the ass in the first place. They work for you and make them do that with you. I mean, there's kind of a perverse kind of fun in that anyway. Well, yeah, there is. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, I loved okay. It. I loved it. I put on my best suit when I went down there to Frankfurt. <laughs> I was very serious. <laughs> um, Davina says in Ontario, she thinks you can actually return those unused bottles to the distributor. I don't know if that's the case here. Uh, yeah, you can. Uh, but the thing is, if you are, um, if you're going to continue to do events like this, um, then you can keep those on hand. You don't believe this is the United States. I don't know how it is in Canada, yeah. uh, but you don't have to forfeit them. Uh, so it's like, you know, um, I knew certain things we were going to need for events going forward at Locust Grove. So when, like, I knew if I was doing like a lecture or a, an evening presentation there, if I had Woodford Reserve and <laughs> Chardonnay in the summer, Cabernet in the winter on the bar, everybody was going to be happy. Everything else was window dressing. Oh, I worked so, that bar. I remember that. Yeah. So it's like it I would Woodford, just Woodford Cab. Woodford, yeah. So Woodford. once the Woodford was out, I get another case of Woodford. I get another case of Chardonnay. You know, I knew those things were things we're going to keep on cycling through, and we just kept them in stock. Um, and so, yeah, when you have your temporary license, you can return them. But if you're going to be doing it again, you don't have to. It's, it's, it's been my experience here, at least. Yeah. And you will, if you are doing things periodically, especially if you are able to be in a position to do stuff year after year, you will start to get a feel mm -hmm. for what it is that people want. You might have a few great ideas off the bat that you're like, wow, none of that sold. Yeah. There were some things I thought were surefire hits and nobody wanted it. And certain things I thought were going to be complete flops and everybody showed up for it. So, yeah. But, you know, compared to food, I mean, again, yeah. alcohol is preservation. So if you've worked events, we've all had that, you know, experience of like, wow, I bought all of this food to sell at the concession and nobody liked it. Alcohol, you can sometimes return. You can also just keep for the next event. Mm -hmm. um, let's see. Yeah. And I think that also... I don't have any more questions coming in right now, um, but just like so people are aware of stuff that we've done, too. It's been really I thought it's been really interesting taking this stuff out into the wild, as it were. Mm -hmm. People are generally really receptive, even when it's not a living history centered event. They are. And that's, it's it's a mixed drink. It's interesting. And yeah, like I said, at the gallery at Gatewood here in LaGrange, um, it was not history centered events, but people were very into it. That was so cool. Yeah. And granted, one of them was Christmas. So like people get us more at Christmas. We're already trying to plan to do more this December. But one was Light Up LaGrange. Yeah. That's well, I guess that was Christmas. That was Christmas. Yeah, that was Christmas. Yeah. It was yeah. so much fun. Mm -hmm. Your girl did do the cha-cha slide in full 1840s out on the dance floor. <laughs> I'm proud of me. Um, but, you know, it was, they were so into it. And they tipped. Oh, my gosh. I'm not going to lie. <laughs> it's, it's, it's a new taste. It's novel. And the thing is, whenever you're dealing with. I think Texas Pharaoh has oh, to go. Good luck. Uh, message us if you. It's good to hear from you. Yeah, yeah I don't know if we can help you in a different state, but feel free to Just, yeah, let us reach know. out. Yeah. Because we want to encourage you to make mm -hmm. it happen. We, we will encourage you to be a pain in the ass to your ABC people. 
<laughs> um, but the thing is, too, it's like when you get into alcohol, um, especially distilled spirits, um, most people want to put at least a veneer of history onto it. Yes, that's, that's true. Thing. Well, like we were talking about, I, I was getting ready for this event. Let's see what we got here. We've got Old Cliffy, Old Tub, Old Forester, and here is the Old Tom. So that is about almost 50% of my spirits. Old is apparently something that people like to associate with their distilled spirits. Uh, so yeah, history kind of naturally lends itself to it, even if you're not in a historic setting. Actually, I don't think Texas is leaving, but now he and Josh are confabbing, which is really cool. Oh, Josh here? Josh is here. He hey, agreed Josh? with you about um, antiques, by the way. Was that? He agreed with you about antiques. Oh, very good. Yeah. It's but, good to see you. Uh, Josh has a great Pharaoh set, by the way. So he yes, he does. Cross-pollinate. Yeah, Pharaoh is a neat thing when somebody's really got the... Uh, Really got the set to do it. And Josh's is so thorough. One of my favorite moments in the event was Josh was doing a Pharaoh game. Um, and I completely ran out of, of chips. I thought I was off the table. He opens his desk up. And he's like, well, don't worry. I've got a land claim I can sell you. <laughs> so, that, that was one of my favorite moments ever. <laughs> I will say, and Josh, I'm glad you had at least given me the rudimentary ideas of Pharaoh before this. Getting to play Pharaoh in Rage's plays at South Park City with some of their regular interpreters was really, really fun. Yeah. That yes. was awesome. <laughs> um, out in Fair Play, Colorado, where we were for all those videos, they were having Burrow Days today, actually, bur actual yeah. Burrow races. I wish we could be there for it. The Burrow is a big thing up there. There's a monument in Fair Play to Prunes, who hey, was Burrow. a... A, a, a beloved a burrow. a burrow, a beloved burrow who lived for what seventy years. Yeah, it was like a <laughs> yeah. long lived burrow. He used to go like bring his master all his stuff out in the mine without even a person with him. Yeah, I never knew how much I wanted a burrow until it was in fair play. Um, but it's it's kind of neat because if you watch the stuff, you can watch it on the South Park City um, social media or the South Park Brewing who we featured or um, the Snitching Lady who we featured. Those are all on Front Street. Um, which well, snit the snitch and and. Um, South Park City are. It's a very small town. It's cool. Um, I noticed, you know, the people racing with the burrows, it's people race with their burrows. They're not, you know, they're not doing a reenactment. They're in modern clothes. But at the same time, it's because that part of that tradition is still so alive and relevant. Mm -hmm. I think that's really cool, too. Yeah, well, there's all different kinds of ways to experience this. Yeah. Any questions? Um, Josh is also agreeing that playing Pharaoh in Rachel's place would be awesome. Yeah. We have got someday we will find a way to get back out there. That was a uh, three days there and three days back. And it was worth it. Yeah. Oh, it was worth it. It's just yeah. not easy we, to make. We will <laughs> descend on it with our whole career next time. Yes, we will. Um, it sounds like Texas Fair was planning a fun thing too. Actually. Oh, nice. Yeah. Will, do we want to touch on Anchor? Oh, yeah. 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 Let me go grab one. Yeah. Want to grab two? Sure. Okay. <laughs> In a corker or a camper? Um, yeah. a, a beloved Victorian beer company is going out of business. We're going to uh, give them a little shout out today. Um, they, it's, up on a, it's up on a nail. On the nail. Yeah. So, um, they, they, they do have a prayer of surviving, but it's, it's up in the air right now. So, oh, and he's getting some mugs. We don't. We haven't talked about beer a whole lot on this channel because it's hard to get at as far as in the Victorian context. We're hoping to do more of that. So, tell us who we're talking about today. Okay, so I couldn't find the actual steam beer because, to Louisville's credit, they had bought it out. This is the Porter from Anchor Brewing Company. Uh, some other folks might be following this. Chime in and chat if you are. Um, Anchor Brewing Company since 1896, and in this case, that's not a stretch. It has been the same company coming out of San Francisco since the 1890s. We've talked about this before. Sometimes people kind of stretch back to connect to an earlier name or an earlier company that they either are technically connected to or aren't at all. Looking at you, Evan Williams. We love Evan Williams. Love Evan Williams. This is just I'm weird. in the film at the museum. He is. <laughs> um, but it has nothing to do with but the it's man not, yeah, Evan named Evan Williams, Williams, who had a distillery in Louisville in the 18th century. Um, but this company, Anchor Brewing, has been a, in a continuously active beer company. And, you know, throughout the 20th century, during what are sometimes regarded as the dark days of American beer and all of that, um, there were, believe it or not, before the craft beer revolution, there were still some small breweries 
that somehow survived all of this. And I don't know the specifics of what they were doing during Prohibition, by the by. Um, some people switched to soda production. They may have done yeah. that. And I don't know that, but that's what some people did to survive and then went back to beer later. You know, I took Anchor for granted. And what I mean by that is I drove by their brewery so often that I never took the tour and I regret it now. Um, they Their big beer is known as Anchor Steam. And it's delightful. It's a very ambery col colored beer. They call it steam beer. They consider it its own type of beer. Um, and I would put it just in the amber category, which is what I really like in beer. And um, I believe if I had the bottle with me, I could read off the description. It comes from the steam that's produced in their process. They were bought out a few years ago, big international conglomerate. Um, there are different stories as to what has led to them supposedly closing. The conglomerate, of course, swears that they came in and everything was already a mess. Other people blame the conglomerate. So two, three weeks ago, it looked like we were just going to lose Anchor Steam. Then it seemed like there was a few people who were interested in possibly buying it. And one of those that I really, really hope, it's like a long shot, but it could happen, is that the employees themselves are making a long shot bid to take over Anchor Beer. So the people, and there's people who have worked there for like 40 years this is not just a job. Like Anchor is what they do. It's their thing. They're a piece of that history. Uh, and so they are trying to do it. The SF Board of Supervisors um, actually apparently just passed a, um, a resolution supporting them. Sapporo has indicated they're open to it. So we'll see. We'll see if Sapporo? they can. It is, it is Sapporo, yes. Okay. I didn't know that. <laughs> yeah. Um, I mean, Sapporo beer is okay, but it's not Anchor. Uh, you know, maybe they were trying to build the Pacific Rim Empire. I don't know. Um, a, I, I just know that there's a chance this will happen. So hopefully we'll get to drink some real Anchor Steam again. But in the meantime, Anchor Porter. That was the one pack that was left at the Total Wine. We checked everywhere else around here. We could find nothing. So to the employees of Anchor. To the employees of Anchor and good luck to you good from the Victorian luck. Bar Room. If there's anything we need to help, absolutely we will. Oh my gosh. And if they make it, if it happens, everybody please go buy yourself a pack of Anchor Steam. It's worth it. And one way, if you find some, get it now. Because, Tell us where you found it. <laughs> yeah. Well, one of the things I love about too, this is, I mean, it's a Victorian beer. Mm -hmm. And their bottles, if you find, I don't know how well you can see on the screen, uh, but if you found some of those guides to the different shapes that beer bottles took, um, was bottling beer the most common thing at that point? No, but it was very much bottled. It had been for a long time. And these kind of ring true um, for that era. And so actually I was getting ready for this 1880s event. Um, and their, their, their labels even come. You were going to go get some anchor I was, yeah. This, this is different. Their, their regular label actually looks pretty Victorian. I was like, well, no problem. I'll just go get a couple of six packs of anchor. I'll throw it in the cooler. I'll be good. And did this out. So. Yeah. So... Um, I haven't shared any articles on the Barroom Facebook page yet, but I might do that so people can follow along. Which, by the way, you can find the Victorian Barroom on Facebook. I don't know how to access that. Yeah, he's not the one. <laughs> Brian made the sensible choice to get off Facebook years ago. That's long all. Long time ago. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, definitely check it out, Davina. If nothing else, you'll you know you'll love the story. But hoping, yeah. hoping. Well, one thing, one of the reasons, this is just a personal story, why the Anchor Porter, even though it's not their main base beer, will always have a special place in my heart, was because uh, Amy and me met in 2012 uh, over the internet, which is strange for somebody who doesn't prefer to use the internet, uh, but that's how so it we happened. We were introduced by a mutual friend. We were, yeah. We got to know each other over the internet. We did, yeah. And so she came out in August, um, and it was great. I was um, living in San Francisco. She was living in San Francisco. I was living in New Albany, Indiana, actually, at that point just across the river world. Um, and then came back in September for the event that I used to, uh, I was one of the organizers at Farsley Mormon, and I knew she liked Anchor, and I knew we both liked Porter, and I didn't, I wasn't familiar with the whole thing yet, and so I got a six-pack of Anchor Porter, which was not the right thing, um, but we enjoyed it very much, and so it always tastes like that weekend to me. It's our beer. Yeah, it's our beer. <laughs> it's a good porter, too. You know, there's bad porters out there, and there's good porters. Yeah. It's good. This is one of the good ones, and I just hope it survives. Um, yeah, so Texas Fair West with a Facebook page would be a good place to talk about period events coming up. Yeah, we'll definitely share anything that we're doing on our Facebook page. Um, and if you want to get in touch with Brian, you can still like message us there, and I'll just get your information and hook you two up. I'm the one of the two of us. I'm the only one who owns a smartphone, which you can see because my eyes will not pick up the chat all the way over there. Sorry, um, nearsighted. I'm looking to downgrade my flip. 
<laughs> um, but then you can do your Captain Kirk impression when you flip it open. That's true. I do flip my flip phone open just like Captain Kirk because when I was a kid, I had my communicator toy and I practiced that. So I got a flip phone. <laughs> but yeah, um, you can find us on Facebook. And that's a good place to get in touch with us. Absolutely. Yeah. And we love talking about this stuff. Um, I think we're past the point in our lives where we personally want to organize living history events anymore. Mm -hmm. But by golly, did we learn a lot. Yes, we did. And Heritage Village, I still owe you an email about that, by the way. Yeah. All righty. Anything else? Let's see. Um, we wanted to give a shout out also, she's not here, but to Heather Tory. Yes, we do. Heather Tory has been one of our biggest supporters. Um, when we, you know, we post the PayPal link, we asked to, you know, tip your bartender and all that. Uh, and she has come through more often than anybody. We just really appreciate Heather. Um, She's been on to our Christmas card list now, and we hope you actually get to meet her in person one of these days. Uh, if she's ever rolling, if, if you listen to this later, Heather, if you're ever rolling through Kentucky, stop by our place and we'll mix them up all for you. Um, so, yeah. Oh, God, that'll be fun. Yeah. Yeah. So, shout out to Heather. Um, yeah. And we do have a PayPal link if anybody does want to tip your bartender. That's great. We appreciate it. Yeah. The understand. PayPal link is in the bottom. Yeah. Um, yeah <laughs> and we're, um, I mean, this isn't our main job, but it does take. At the very least, some uh, time and effort and booze to keep this going. So um, no pressure, but tips gladly accepted. Um, and yes, uh, Davina also points out the community page. We will put stuff like that on the community page as well. So check that out. I know YouTube's not always great about showing the community page to people, but if you go there on YouTube, it's like after videos, shorts, et cetera, you can find stuff. And every time we have an upcoming event, we'll put it there. Yes. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah, if anybody has any ideas, let us know. Um, glad to hook up with other people. Yeah, yeah absolutely. Yeah. Well, this 50 minutes went by really yeah. fast. Well, thanks, everybody, uh, for everything. Again, I want to remind everybody to please, uh, since you're here on YouTube already, on August the 14th, it's a Monday at 8 p.m., check out My Whiskey Den. Um, and check them out anyway, because they do some great shows. They're, uh, they're live almost every Monday, discussing all different it's kinds fun. of topics. Yeah, of, uh, yeah, on... Um, with whiskey, usually. Uh, we'll be back at Vinoge on October the 7th with Alan Bishop. Uh, also, please check out Alan's page, One Piece at a Time yes. Distilling Institute. That's One Piece at a Time Distilling Institute. You're going to get deeper in the weeds on distilling uh, than you will anyplace else on that page. Uh, and then we'll be back at Vinoge on December the 9th for the Christmas event. And we'll be doing Christmas with Heritage Village and Sharon Bill. We just had confirmed here on December the 15th. Uh, that was a lot of fun, uh, yes. that last one we did. We yeah, did four was. drinks. It's they, they've got buildings from throughout the whole 19th century, and we kind of wander through the whole century uh, yeah. out there having something different in each location. Uh, it was just fantastic, and they got a great crew. So, Lawrence is there hoping they might get a light snow by then. That would be fantastic. I'm, yeah. we're, we're I'm gonna so do, excited. To be it, it's going to be like peak Victorian Christmas at this thing. I've already, I've got three, I know three of the four things we're doing already, and I'm just going to come up with that last idea, and it's going to be. Memorable. Yeah, um, and Cincinnati they're, also, area, Cincinnati. Yeah, they're yeah. also doing a Christmas event on the 9th. Um, which just like God, we, we wanted to be there so could bad. we be in two yeah. places at once? And um, no, Venosh had us already. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah, we did that one last year, yeah. so that's kind of a returning going mm -hmm. home. But yeah, the fact that we ended up that Lauren was like, "Oh, well, why don't we just add something else on the calendar?" Yeah, we'll do like, that. Really? Yep. <laughs> you get to do it all. Yeah. So it looks like, I mean, just a preview. It looks like we're probably going to do Smoking Bishop again from a Christmas Carol, Dickens' own punch recipe from the 1840s, and yeah. then wassail, a real wassail. Yeah, which is not what you think it is. Not what you think it is at all. It's delicious, and then I'm working on that fourth one. Well, I don't know. Our viewers are pretty educated. Maybe they might know exactly what it is. Um, I know at some point I probably bought some cheap holiday-themed beer and thought it was wassail when I was young and dumb. Yep, we're going to do the real thing. Yes, we are. All right. Okay. Um, Shady Hill Homestead, it's a great show. Hey, Shady Hill. Good to see you. Well, this has been fantastic, it's people. Been. Thanks, everybody, for coming. Uh, this has been a lot of fun. I didn't expect these to work so well, but... Yeah. If you can, please tip your bartender. If not, please just keep bringing us your uh, fun comments and your companionship. Yeah. Thanks, everybody. Thank you.